we haven't started yet, but for anyone who's in the Discord, I'd definitely recommend going to YouTube, um, the MGSCon YouTube page. Hello, MGSCon family and Metal Gear fans from around the world. My name is Eric Marks, and I'm so honored to be hosting today's event. September 3rd, 1998 was a very special day in gaming history, as that's when Metal Gear Solid 1 was first released. We're here to celebrate the game's 25th anniversary. This event is being brought to you by the MGS Con team. I was lucky enough to attend MGS Con in person back in July, and I was blown away by the tight knit community and incredible positive energy that was in the air that memorable day. Stay tuned for more MGS Con news on our website as well as our Twitter and Instagram channels. Appreciate you joining us for this event as well. For the full experience of this event, please head to the MGS Con YouTube channel. You can watch this on our Discord as well, but you might miss a few goodies if you're not watching on YouTube, so please head there. As a fun exercise, let's reflect back on the state of console gaming in 1997, the year before MGS1 was released. Top selling titles were Final Fantasy VII, Mario Kart 64, and Pocket Monsters on Game Boy. Highest fidelity console games were on CD-ROMs, and on the PS1 you had two controller ports, a 128 kilobyte memory card, and there was no way to connect home consoles to the internet. 25 years later, and we now take believable storytelling, cinematic experiences, and top-notch voice acting in games for granted. The bar for all of this was firmly set by Metal Gear Solid in 1998. This game single-handedly reshaped our expectations for all games thereafter. It inspired other creators to become better storytellers and paved the way for genuine emotional connections between the player and in-game characters. Simply put, the history of storytelling in games cannot be told without Metal Gear Solid. I'm lucky to be joined today by two absolute trailblazers of modern game storytelling. With us today are Metal Gear Solid voice director and casting director, Kim, uh, Chris Zimmerman Salter, as well as the legend of Shadow Moses himself, David Hader, aka Solid Snake. Chris and David, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, everybody. Our pleasure. Kept you waiting, huh? <laughs> um, Chris, your role on MGS1 was critical in bringing all the characters we know and love to life. Uh, prior to starting on MGS1, how did you originally become a voice director, and what types of projects were you working on in the mid-90s? I uh, worked at Hanna-Barbera, uh, fresh out of college, as a, a production assistant, basically, and I spent my summers typing Smurfs scripts. And uh, then I eventually was promoted to become the talent coordinator, um, setting up all the actor schedules and, and all that stuff and their contracts. And then I was promoted to casting director and then eventually started directing some shows. Like very, very first directing um, was a little bit of a um, Surprise, uh, I was uh, doing a show called Capital Critters. Gordon Hunt was our director, and he'd been out most of the day, which was not uncommon because he did a lot of other things besides working at Hanna-Barbera. Um, and I got a phone call at about 5.30, and he said, I have pneumonia. You'll be fine. And that's how I directed my first show. <laughs> Um, I think Ed Asner was in the cast, uh, uh, Neil Patrick Harris was in the cast, Charlie Adler was in the cast, and I was terrified until I said, okay, well, let's do lines one through 18, and they did it, and I said, okay, Charlie, I like this here, Ed, could you please do this here, da-da-da-da-da, and then they all did what I asked, and it was like, I got addicted. <laughs> wow. And then, so after all of that, um, at some point you got brought aboard Metal Gear Solid coming from the Hanna-Barbera world. How did you initially come aboard? Well, I got a phone call out of the blue one day. They were looking for a director, and a, a woman in Keiko called me and said, would you be interested in um, directing a game for us? Uh, and I agreed to do it. And then she proceeded... Um, to tell me that they'd hired a casting director already that was a, a commercial casting director. Um, and I said, okay, great. We're going to hold a week's worth of auditions. Fantastic. Um, but I tell you what, let me give you, tw I want 20 slots to fill. We'll see all her people, but I want 20 slots to fill. So this is over, over 200 people came into audition for it. 
19 of my 20 got the parts. So basically, this is a cherry pick cast, uh, and I couldn't be happier with the results. Like characteristics about these actors jumped out to you. I mean, obviously we have uh, David here with us right now. Like, what about them did you know fit these characters right away? I knew they were good actors, and um, it, it just it it was long time ago, obviously. But I just knew that they were all really good actors, and I wanted to have my bases covered, knowing that these other actors are on camera people, uh, commercial on camera people, so they don't even really have very many lines usually, and um, needed people that could handle the massive load of of script. Which the Metal Gear script was, no kidding, it was this big. Most gaming scripts back in the day, back in that time, were 100 pages long. This was just, it was 1,500 pages long, probably. I imagine that must have been uh, strange for you, too, coming from the animation world. I imagine scripts were nowhere near that long. They were like 30 pages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, um, David, you... you juggled being a voice actor and screenwriter and, and done both at a very high level over the course of your career. Uh, what initially drew you to voice acting in the first place? Uh, well, uh, I, you know, I started acting when I was nine years old and I did a lot of theater and um, I had, so I had, you know, I'd been training my voice. My parents used to do uh, accents around the house and so I would pick up that sort of thing. And then when I was uh, 16, I was living in Japan. I was going to an international school and a video game company came to our school and said, we need four guys who speak English to do arcade games, uh, voices for arcade games. And so we, you know, <laughs> four trusting 16 year olds piled into a van and we went down to a studio in, in Kobe and recorded these games. They never told us what the games were, but um, but essentially, I, it means I've been doing voices in video games since they've had voices in video games. And I loved it so much that I started pursuing anything I could do vocally. I started doing um, English language voice tapes and, you know, anything I could do in Japan. And, and, uh, uh, and then when I came to America, uh, it didn't occur to me to pursue voiceover. I didn't really know how to do it. Um, but I booked a role on, on a show called Major Dad, where I played a Russian character. And, you know, I speak like this, I'm a Russian uh, boy, you know, this very delightful. And, uh, and Chris's mentor, Gordon Hunt, was in the audience, uh, and he asked me if I would play a Russian on the show Captain Planet, and that's where I met Chris Zimmerman Salter, who was the director of the episode, and who walked me through my first U.S. voiceover job. <laughs> Oh, I don't think I realized you spoke Japanese as well, David. That, that's amazing. Uh, poorly, but yes, I do. <laughs> um, what were some of your early conversations like with Chris as you were developing uh, Snake's voice at, on the first game? Um, well, I was afraid to talk to Chris, so not, not much. Um, I, you know, I didn't want to reveal to her that I was completely incapable of handling this job, so... I, uh, uh, I, I just, you know, I met her at the, at the audition and it's lovely to see her again. I did the thing, but you know, you do hundreds of auditions, thousands of auditions and, and, uh, you just sort of say, oh, well, I think that went well or stupid, 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 or, or both, you know, and then, um, uh, and then it was Jennifer Hale who called me and said, guess who's going to make some money? And I was like, is it me? Cause I'm hoping it's me. <laughs> So I didn't have any money, and and uh, uh, and then she, uh, you know, Chris let Jennifer tell me I got the part. They sent me the script, um, and then uh, you know I had auditioned with with my voice, which is you know when I was younger, I mean would have sounded like this, and but then I got the script, and I found out that Snake was already retired, and he was already a legend, and he was bitter, and he didn't want to come back, and I was like. I think this guy needs to sound older than me. He needs to sound like he's been dragged across miles of bad road. And, and so by the time I came in, it, it, it sort of had transformed into this. And um, uh, so we started working, and uh, it was great. And then about halfway through the first day, Chris said, uh, 
said, hey, can I play you the voice you auditioned with? And I said, sure. And so I knew what the voice was. And uh, so I was like, you know, do you think we should re-record it as the way I audition? But and then and then Chris was like, no, I, I think this is working. And and I felt, I, you know, it, it was a weird thing. I felt really good about it as well. I kind of felt like it was it was really playing well. I I, I sensed that the audience was going to respond to it, and which you know doesn't, which was very rare for me, especially back then, um, to feel that kind of excitement about it. So, but we both, you know, we both felt good about it, and. That's how the snake voice came to be. And it matches perfectly with the artwork. Yeah, and that was and that was part of the inspiration as well, seeing seeing the artwork and just seeing how how hard this guy was and and how dedicated and so all of that all of that played into what I felt, you know, he would sound like. I was I was curious actually like before you started recording uh Chris and David like what sorts of materials did you receive when you were sort of playing in the game other than the script like did you have a lot of character artwork biography and things like that we had a we had a the artwork was sent for the auditions we didn't really have biographies that i remember i got a box this big of a box and wow. as i mentioned back then was uh scripts were about 100 pages so i waited till sunday afternoon to go through it and was sitting on the back point, oh, I might as well. We're getting ready for having a barbecue. And I might as well pull out my script. Where's the separation between these scripts? And I just started doing page numbers and uh, I had to really read fast. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, I got the I got the script in advance too, which has never happened again. Um uh, they you know, every subsequent game they would just keep the script secret. And so when we would record um, any of the Metal Gear games, apart from the first one, what you're hearing as the actors do their lines is, the, is pretty much the first or second time that we've read the lines. So that's another testament to the cast and to Chris's directing that, you know, we are all just flying by the seat of our pants and trying to make this incredibly complex world uh, make sense. Oh. Um. So you, obviously, you, you mentioned coming from the world of Hanna Barbera animation. As you came aboard this game, like what were some of your goals um, of bringing this game story to life? To make it seem as realistic to the story as possible, and to get great performances out of my actors. I would say that, that success on every level. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, um, let's see. So, uh, there was, you know, obviously Japanese, um, voice acting in the game. I think that was prior to you all recording. Is that right? Like there was, there was the Japanese was already recorded and edited in of, of, for all the voices before you all started. Yes. Is it a, a challenge at all for, for you all to match the timing of that in the, in the game? When we had to do that, there was picture. Um, when it was necessary to do that in the cutscenes, there was picture that we uh, were able to view while the actors were performing. A uh, process is called auto, uh, ADR, and or looping, I guess. And um, that was available to us, but we didn't get it ahead of time. You know, I didn't get to see it ahead of time at all. It was all in the moment, on the spot. Um, for the second game, the Japanese clients were here the whole time. I don't, I guess they were here for the first game too, but they were, um, the first game you guys, we recorded in Valentino's mansion in Beverly Hills, which is really more of a big house than uh, uh, what we would call a mansion today. Um, there was no separation between the actors and the production team and myself. So there was no glass, so nobody could make any sounds, but the mansion itself had a squeaky floor a stop sign out front where any time a car or motorcycle stopped, it would ruin a take and no air conditioning in the middle of summer. So uh, that was comfortable. <laughs> oh. But yeah, and, and then another that... game we had um, two bars that let the actor know when the time was up. So we'd have to just um, do it a couple times till we hit those, hit that, those marks. 
the setup changed significantly after the first game, right? Of, of how you all recorded the type of space you were in, right? When they came back to me and asked me to do another Metal Gear, I said, I'd be happy to, but the rules are changing. The actors are getting a raise and we're doing it in a real studio. And, and um, yeah, and, you know, making sure that they were signed up with the union and all that. Do you, you think there are any, like, positives to them being in the same space and that the sort of setup you had in the first game in terms of performance? Like, did it affect, do you think, uh, I guess for David, too, like, do you I think mean, it affected we, the performances? I don't remember having large groups of people, um, as we discussed yesterday, but I do remember two or three people being in the uh, Valentino stage at the same time. But the spaces that I used for um, studio records had very large booths. They were animation stages, mostly. And for animation, for example, I worked on Curious George for a number of years, and I'd have 12 people in there. 12 people with 12 mics. It's like herding cats. But, yeah, definitely it's um, to have the actors being able to play off of each other is certainly helpful. Nowadays, it's very rare for a game because they're all so large that it's very rare to have... Um, multiple people records just for um timing's sake and uh finances david do you feel like the setup in, in mgs1 the way you all recorded um helped your performance in any way compared to the others yeah i kept it from sucking um hopefully uh yeah well you know it was it was there apart from the weird house we recorded in it was you know, it was very much like um, that first voiceover job on Captain Planet, where we, you know, we all were in a room and we had mics together, and and you know that allows you to react to the actors. It allows you to play it, you know, like a radio play. So you hear the other actors, you hear what they're doing. They react off of you. You react off of them, and it's so much better for that cinematic feel, you know, for the reality of the of the scene. And you know, the house. House was weird and hot and awkward and not soundproof, but I'm kind of reminded of, you know, I have some friends that are, are, you know, rock and roll stars and they record albums in houses and the house, you know, gives you this sort of personality. And so I think this weird, creaky house sort of added to the atmosphere of, of Metal Gear 1. That said, I was a lot happier being in an air-conditioned uh, studio <laughs> for Metal Gear 2. Um, you know, Chris definitely got them to a place where it was a lot more professional and, and um, not so uh, desperately weird. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, it was cool. Dave, let's move on, move on to the important questions here. Uh, you, if you had to pick one actor who was your absolute favorite to work with in the first game, who was it? And we, we won't tell anyone here, right? I mean, we'll, we can keep a secret. I, I don't think anyone's share this information. Oh, well, look, I, I, you know, it's very difficult because I, I love them all. I've remained friends with pretty much all of them for the past 25 years. One sec. I'm getting a call. What? You guys, I, I like a code? <gasps> Could it be? Snake! Snake! Oh, what the hell? What are you doing? What, hey, were, you were, know... were you hiding in a locker? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I was. At least he wasn't under the desk. No, I was hiding in the locker. But you know the answer to that question that you I, just got asked. I was. You don't just, have to say it. You don't have to say it. I was just it's about to right. say your name, Christopher Randolph. <laughs> um, as I say, I, I love all the actors. They're all amazing. Yes. All their characters are amazing. And they're just lovely people. Some of my very best friends in the world. But working with Otacon, that's that's the defining relationship uh, for me in Metal Gear. And I was saying yeah. to Chris just yesterday, to both Chris's, that um, every time I play Metal Gear Solid, I, I let Meryl die so that Otacon and I can go off on the uh, snowmobile yeah. together at the end. That's, um, a, so. that's a wonderful tribute. I'm, I'm <laughs> deeply touched. Uh, I really De Debbie May West was not impressed, but uh, but yeah. Yeah, no, Debbie Debbie was not happy about that, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no question that that relationship uh, to me it just sort of I don't know it, it it's unique and it really encapsulates the somehow the spirit of 
of the game, particularly in the first in the first game. I I always feel like you know people ask about Snake's personality, or they do or they do their impression, and they're like, "Colonel, I'm doing a thing," and whatever. And I'm like, "Please stop doing that immediately." <laughs> but um, <laughs> please don't do that, friend. <laughs> but please don't do that. Um, uh, but uh, the. The real key to Snake for me is that he he is tough, he is hardened, he, he's seen everything, but he can't help responding to people in need. And, mm. you know, it's his heart that makes him so lovable. And Chris, you know, Otacon represents his heart and his conscience and, and mm. those things. So it's a, it's such a lovely relationship and it's i love being part of like a legendary gaming duo you know if, if we're like abbott and costello or something and yeah um and so i think you know i think the scenes with otacon really illustrate just how how soft snake is on the inside and how much he cares about the people around him yeah i i agree and i i don't i mean i don't think anything like that had ever been put into a game um you know the idea of well even the idea of humor which which but you know with with snake and Otacon, there's quite a bit of of humor there but the the the, the deep heart um that that both of them have and the kind of affection they have for each other i i don't know if you know back in in 98 if anything had ever been done like that in game i mean i don't think so i don't think so think either so. Uh, um, yeah, I'd never seen anything like it. We're also just reflecting on the, the experience of you know recording MGS one in that house. So, what memories stick out for you from that experience? Uh, yeah, that house. Um, you know, I I agree with everything that, that that's been said so far. I I um, <laughs> you know, that was that was my first job uh, ever, sort of being a voice actor I'd, I'd done a lot of theater yeah. before that and a little bit of on camera but never never this kind of thing so, so to some degree i was like well is this the way it's always done um do we always have to stop when a, a fire engine goes by um what i remember most oddly is like no one could move when we were recording and and because there was no as as Chris said there there was no glass between us and the technicians and the, the you know I mean how many people were there Chris there, there must have been there seven a, or eight anyway oh there was more than that behind more me more than that so yeah. we're all in a room and no one could even drop a pencil or anything it because it would, it, it would you know so it was kind of there was something a little bit feeling like it was almost live theater almost because we actually had a sort of an audience right there with us, um, uh, which I kind of enjoyed and also made me a, a little nervous, but that was okay. I think that contributed. Um, so I remember that. I remember that the, the holding room when you, when you, when you were, you had time, you had a break or there was time off was the kitchen of this house. And it wasn't, you know, for Valentino's house, it, it wasn't really a tremendously great kitchen, but I remember hanging out there and you know you could get yourself a cup of tea or or a snack or something but you're just in this kitchen and the 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 back stairs sort of went down into this scraggly yard as i recall i don't know it was 25 years ago so i'm i may yeah, be misremembering there, but there was a couple of buildings and i think the kitchen was in the sep the the other building oh maybe that's what it was yeah, you had to go you had to go over there and then down the stairs yeah <sighs> Just amazing. Oh. Absolutely. Um, right. I had no idea this was your first, like, uh, you know, game performance. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Like, what, for you, what, you know, how did the voice of Otacon come to life as you remember it? Well, um, you know, for me, it, it, it really just kind of came out based on the picture I had been handed in the audition. Um, which was, uh, um, oddly, you know, back then I, my, my hair was a little longer and I had a little more of it. And I, I used to wear, you know, round wire rim glasses. And I, I think I probably was 
was wearing those. Um, and so it, it, the picture actually looked a little bit like me. I mean, a little bit in that first game. And then Otacon evolved as, as the games went on and to the degree where he didn't look like me at all. But, um, but the voice came from looking at the picture. And, um, and that's kind of what you do. And then, you know, you, I looked at the script and, you know, I, it might have evolved a little bit when I got more of a sense of how vulnerable he was, particularly at the beginning. The, you know, when, when he first appears, he, he's, he's very vulnerable and he's, he's very frightened um, to the degree, as we all know, that he's, he's uh, peed on himself <laughs> almost. I mean, you see that happen. And uh, there was no and almost I about thought, it. I... No, yeah, no, he he did he peed right on yourself. Let yourself you right on the desk. And um, um, and so you know, it's possible that I think I, I, I think I mentally anyway made a little bit of an adjustment when I read the script and sort of saw that. And it also seemed to me that um, and. <sighs> You know, I, I may be, this may be revised history, but I, I, I think there, were, there was a part of me that thought, well, you know, here's a, he can't be the same as this big action hero. You know, he, there needs to be a contrast. So his kind of vulnerability and his um, innocence almost, uh, okay. I, th I thought was appropriate. Um, and so... That kind of that kind of all bled into the voice, I think. It's amazing. I, I also want to say about mm -hmm. that choice. That's a not only, you know, real human beautiful choice, but it's very gutsy for a guy. And and Chris auditioned to play Snake as well. Yes, I did. Um, That's right. <laughs> and you know, when I started, well, I started doing the voice, and I, you know, I'm talking like this, and mo a lot of the male actors who would come in would start out somewhere hear what i was doing and then gruff it up more you know because they didn't mm. want to be out out tough guy and i'm like stop that i'm the lead you know um and <laughs> yeah, yeah and chris and chris was so generous in just accepting that you know that vulnerable character to sort of play off of me and you know a lot of actors wouldn't do that their ego would get in the way and yet you know chris was so confident in what he was doing that it you know it, it was you know what our relationship was just clicked into place in that first scene it, it yeah i know that that's that's so interesting because i agree that that we never really talked about their relationship or anything nope. it just, we just started I know, it, it just it just happened and i think mm -hmm. that's certainly I mean, that's certainly, uh, you know, our work, but it's also the writing, I think. I mean, we yeah. took our cues from the writing. And and again, if you're talking about MGS1 as a sort of a groundbreaker, I feel like it was the first game that really had amazing writing, you know? Um, so, you know, we... We benefit. I, I mean, I I benefited from the writing and the people who put that together, and then and then David's amazing performance. And it, you know, to have something to play off of, it it just makes things so much easier. And then you know, Chris whispering in our ear <laughs> every now and then, <laughs> which was great. Better. Yeah. Stop yeah. sucking. Do it right. <laughs> Stop sucking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want, I want to ask you too about that, Christopher. Like, what, what do you remember about working with, with Chris, you know, in, in terms of directing in that room and just kind of like how, um, you know, just how, how the, you know, how it all played out there as a team? He, sure. Is, well, who are you, which Chris are you asking the question to? Oh, sorry. Um, I'm Christopher, but I love both perspectives. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we, we, we did an interview on Streamily yesterday and, and someone was saying what I completely agree with, which is that, Chris's direction is very subtle and minimal, but that's it it's all you need. And after a time, it I started to feel like there was almost a psychic connection because sometimes it she would just do a gesture or something and somehow we would get it. And I'm not the only actor who in the game who feels that way. Um 
And that is, that is a very exciting thing to, to have that. The other thing is, and I don't know if anyone's ever talked about this, um, Chris, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but the, I, I find sometimes we're working at a real pace and we get going and, and there's, a, there's a kind of a rhythm and you keep going and it all just sort of falls into place, whereas it might not if things had to slow down. Um, and sometimes they do have to slow down because, you know, there's a technical issue or there's a question or something. But I think the most exciting moments for me are is when we're, we're, we run through an entire page, even with back and forth, and it, it's just mm-hmm. going bam, bam, bam. You know what I mean? It's like I treat it as acting not just reading (laughs) yes no but so many people just treat it like reading and so many so many voice actors when i teach my classes um it's all about you're given these scripts at the last minute you don't necessarily especially gaming scripts you don't get to take them home and study them or anything like that so it's got to be quick so the quicker the actors and myself can find the moment that that character is in the smoother it goes and sitting around and thinking about it and stewing over it is going to s- slow the process down. But it also, I don't think that necessarily helps too much. It belabors it. Yeah. Yeah. I and plus when you have 1500 pages to get through in a week, you got to go fast. <laughs> yeah. You got you it. I also, yeah. also want to say, cause I just, I just realized this, you know, we've talked for years about Chris's, Chris Zimmerman's um, psychic uh, abilities. And I just realized what, what it is, is she'll just make a gesture. She'll be like, on this line, it's got to be more, you know, and it's, it's not that we're reading her mind. It's that she's acting, she's feeling the moment and we can just see it on her face. And once you get to know her, um, yeah, it's, it can be wordless. It's like, it's like here, you know, maybe it's more of a, and I'll be like, yeah, I, yeah, I got it, you know? And, and uh, it's, it's really quite a magical thing. It's, it's, it's because a lot of, you know, not all directors have such a facility with acting and with actors. And, and that's part of Chris's genius that I just realized. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, Chris is a really wonderful actor, you know? I was a theater major. Yeah. I don't know if you guys yeah, know that. See, yeah, see, you know, and and people always ask me about voice acting and, you know, how do you get into voice acting? And, and which is a perfectly wonderful question. My answer is always go take an acting class, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because it's no different. I mean, it is different, but but if you have to be you have to be a good actor to be a good voice actor. That's that's the bottom line, really. It's so, It's true. You have to be a top notch actor. Because all you have is your voice. Right. Yeah. You, you know, if, if you go take an acting class, you, you, you get to use your body and, and all of that stuff. But then when you, you get into a booth, you have to take all that stuff away and still communicate the same emotions and, and go through the same. It's the same kind of uh, process as acting, but you're limited in, in your tool to communicate. Fascinating. So, um. Chris, for a final question for you, um, when you sure. look back on the, f- the first Metal Gear Solid game, what makes that project and, and this experience stand out to you over the course of your career? Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you, it, at the time, it was for me, because I, I, was, I was clueless about a lot of things, but, but I was particularly clueless about the gaming world. And uh, so at the time, it was a really interesting and fun diversion. And, and I had a really good time. And so I, you know, began to, I, I began, it sort of opened me up in terms of the things that I could do as an actor. Um, then when the game was released, and it became such a thing, I began to realize what, um, I don't know how extraordinary the extraordinary reach of of this medium, you know, which I really had been unaware of. I think I think David knew because he had experience with games before, but 
it, it was it was remarkable to me. And then throughout through as the series has gone on, it's just become even more and more remarkable. Uh, and I'm I'm deeply grateful. I, I feel like I just kind of stumbled into it, um, uh, mostly thanks to Chris Zimmerman. And uh, and Chris Zimmerman is thanks to Jennifer Hale, because Jennifer was the one who referred me to Chris's class, which is how I got to know Chris. Um, so, you know, sometimes you you just you just fall into uh, a, a wonderful, soft, terrific place. And, mm-hmm. and that's what Metal Gear is. I wish we could do more, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I miss Otacon, you know. I miss Otacon. I, I I know you have to move on, but I, I really, you know, I do I do cameos every now and then. People want me to do Otacon, and I'm so happy to do it because I get to revisit this character that I love so much. But uh, um, I really do. I miss the whole experience very much. Amazing here. <laughs> um, Christopher, thank you so much for joining us today. We We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Eric. I, I was really happy to be asked and happy to come on and, and talk with these two wonderfully talented artists and you. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, thank thank you guys. And, and thanks to all the fans who kind of make this worth doing. That's what I think. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Hope I'll see you guys soon. I hope to see you sometime soon. I, next time I come to LA, we, we well, you got to contact us and we'll have a party. I will. All right, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Christopher. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Have, thank take you. care. Nice to see you. Thank you. That's Christopher Randolph, the voice of Otacon, uh that we all know and love. It's so great to see that that he had this bond with you, David and, and Chris, and it's not just thing on the screen that you know that the you know we experience as the player or the audience like that this is like these are real relationships i think the entire cast with me um all became very very dear friends yeah it was a it was a great bonding experience but but uh, yeah chris chris randolph is right that the writing in the opening in their introduction scene is just, you know the guy's been locked in a locker. He's terrified. He's peed himself. Snake's trying to get information, but he's trying to stay dry. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it, it was very it was a complex, enjoyable uh, way yeah. to introduce us, and it was hilarious. So we was instantly hilarious. bonded. Yeah, and I had no idea that he had auditioned for the role of Snake too. That was quite interesting to hear that all that whole backstory. Yeah, so it's not like he can't play a tough guy. It's just he he opted to really be vulnerable and and lovely and yeah, pretty great. Yeah, um, David. So uh, I have to ask, you know, as a fan, and I'm sure all the fans want to know, do you have a favorite line from Metal Gear Solid One? Because I'm I'm sure all the fans know all the lines, but there's got to be like a surprise line maybe that people aren't thinking about that's like your favorite line of dialogue. I don't know. You know, there's so many cool ones and weird one there's a surveillance camera and a hind d colonel what's a russian gunship doing here that sort of thing i don't know what that's that's not it uh oh wait 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 i got one wait hold on hold on i'm getting another call here wait a second i'm so sorry guys i keep getting calls disrupting our event wait how how about this Uh, line i never knew an analyst of military technology could be so Cute. I believe I'm being hit on by the famous Solid Snake. <laughs> <laughs> May Ling, yes. how are you? Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Good. Great. 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 Thank, Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. It's been a great Metal Gear weekend. It has. It has. It's been really fun. Thanks for having me on. Are, 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 um, are you having uh, camera difficulties? No, I'm just very still person. <laughs> okay, you're just sitting in a in a cave. In a very <laughs> nice. And using ventriloquism, so you don't see my mouth move. Oh my god! Fantastic. <laughs> Multi talented. Multi talent. Uh, so, Kim Mai, uh, I have to ask first, how did uh, the voice of Mei Ling come to life for you on this game? 
for me, I got a, I, well, first, like so many of the other actors, I was in Chris's voiceover class and um, had an amazing time and just loved it. And right after that, I got a call from her and she said, can you do a Chinese accent? And I was like, um, how long do I have? And she said, three days. And I said, yes. <laughs> so I, uh, I rented the uh, movie Red Corner. And I worked on that and worked on that and um, came into the old house and walked into a closet and uh, did all my lines. And uh, yeah, it was really fun. And then I thought, oh, my God, I did so horrible. I was crying for hours because I thought, oh, my God, I was just so awful. (laughs) You know, never once. Yeah, that's that's oh, my God. And I think it was a while until they let us know. So I just kind of forgot about it. And um, and then I got the call and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and so that was my very first voiceover audition and job. And then Chris uh, got me or introduced me to my now agent of 25 years, <laughs> Sandy Schnarr. And uh, yeah, That's so the rest agent. was history. Oh yeah, she's all the yeah. Sandy. <laughs> I wanted yeah, you to be right? taken care of. <laughs> um, I also want to uh, yeah. point out a bit of trivia that my first on-camera starring role was in a movie called Guyver Dark Hero, um, which we shot in 1993. And um, among the young crew members there, uh, helping put together the movie, was a very young. Kim, my guest, and that's where we initially met. Uh, and so we were friends for five years before she showed up. I didn't know she was going to be Mei Ling, and, and then there she was. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. I know. That's what I thought too when I walked into the house recording studio and I saw you there, and I'm like, what? I know. It was what just like guys. Right here. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Kim Maya, as you were you were sort of like finding this character's voice, like what what makes Mei Ling's character special to you? Oh gosh, well I think she is really cute, so I have to love that about her. <laughs> and um, I, I love the fact that she's like so smart, you know, but it's not a big deal. It's just who she is, and um, I love the fact that she must have read a lot of different books because she had all her quotes, you know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Shakespeare and, you know, which I thought was really challenging to do with a Chinese accent, <laughs> but, but we got through it. And uh, yeah, and I also loved the um, the interactions that we had as a full cast and um, being able to play off them and then getting... The direction, the always amazing direction from Chris. <laughs> I uh, was really nervous, of course, because it was my first job, and I just tried to be prepared. And um, and so, yeah, I, I thought of all, a lot of different things about Mei Ling just from her picture and thinking what it'd be like to be, well, I guess it wasn't so, so much of a stretch because I was kind of young then and just kind of new to everything and everyone else was kind of really famous already. And so it really wasn't much of a stretch. <laughs> wow. Um, we were talking quite a bit about this, the, the house that you all recorded in and the experiences there. What, yeah. what memories stick out to you about recording this game in that house with this group? Oh, gosh, I'm not, I couldn't hear what you guys were saying to the other ones, um, the other guests, but. But definitely, the, I remember the stop sign and how we had to stop for traffic because we could hear the trucks and the motorcycles revving up as they left. And then there was this floorboard underneath me that was really squeaky. <laughs> I couldn't move an inch with my feet because then we'd get the little squeaks and stuff. Um, yeah, I remember it being super hot and like sweat running down my face. And oh, this is another tip. Uh, as a newbie voiceover, I like had a really cold smoothie right before I showed up for my session. <laughs> so my tongue felt like it was an ice cube and I wasn't wearing sunglasses. So I came in from the bright sun and I could not see the script. Literally, I couldn't see, I couldn't talk. <laughs> I couldn't move. <laughs> All lessons learned. Oh, 
That's really never incredible. Know. Yeah, right? Never know. <laughs> you did a fantastic yeah. job, as always. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you did. Cool. I am so grateful to you, Chris. I cannot even tell you, seriously, in so many ways. Not just, okay, you know, welcome. giving me my first job, but, but, you know, not just giving me my first job or mm. setting me up with my agent, but just being the amazing, beautiful person you are and inspiration in so many w- ways. Ah, uh, thank <laughs> not you. Pers- not just pref- professionally, but personally as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Don't I, make me cry. To that point, I also want to say that um, people ask me all the time, all the time, they're like, what's it like working with Hideo Kojima? And I'm like, I have no idea um, because we never worked together. You know, he, he oversees the Japanese version of the game. And then when it comes to America, Chris is the director. She, she, she's the one who's run every single Metal Gear session you've ever heard. She's the one we, we look to and work with. And that's not to diminish Kojima's uh, input. The man is brilliant and he creates these incredible worlds and we all owe you know, an enormous uh, uh, debt and thanks to him. But as far as the work goes, you know, it was always uh, Chris that ran the show. So, mm, yeah. um, so I wish more people would ask me what it's like working with uh, Chris Zimmerman Salter. Ah, thank you. <laughs> to add to that a little bit, um, I just forgot what I was going to say. During the f- second game, I've only seen Kojima. I've probably seen him less than 10 times in all the amount of games that I've done. Um, he'll come, he came to the beginning of the second game. He pops in sometimes if there's a celebrity actor doing a, a minor character. Um, but he's, he's, you know, he did his part already. He created the dang thing. But um, uh, yeah, it's gone. Yeah, <laughs> it'll come. Yeah, out. and um, it was. Oh, I know what really... it was. Oh, um, during the second game, uh, we were in a proper studio, and I'm in the front uh, at the the console where the engineer is, and there's people behind me. The Japanese people would confer over, you know, I do the, and they don't speak English, so they're just basing it on energy levels and and things like that. Um, Then a translator, I'd be talking to actors while they're back there talking, and a translator would then say to me, okay, they think that this needs to happen and this needs to happen and this character needs to have more of this. And I'd say, yeah, I already told them all that. And so then they would start saying, psycho, psycho. And I'm like, (laughs) I've, I've, and this is happening like for an hour. And finally I said, why do they keep calling me psycho? And she said, in Japanese, that means ultimate. So that was quite the compliment. Oh. Yeah. So cool. Did give me a compliment. For a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. That could yeah. be our nickname um, for you now, Chris. That's true. I'll just call you psycho. <laughs> I think that I, I think is interesting about Mei Ling's character in the first game is I, I think she's only visible through the codec, right? I don't think there's there is any in person interactions with Snake or anyone with, with Mei Ling in the game. Right. And like one thing that in this game that stood out to me is just how lively and engaging the, the um, performances are during all the long codec calls in the game. Like we really I think we developed these connections with like Naomi and Mei Ling, obviously, and so many yeah. people over the codec. Um so what was your approach to just directing the actors during these long codec calls to kind of keep things engaging and make the human connection so personal and real? Well, it's, as we've been talking about, um, it's all about the acting. It's all about what their character's feeling in the moment, what they're, what they're talking about. Is it serious? Is it humorous? Um, and it all comes down to the acting. And I think that's what made the connection with a lot of these characters to the audience. Yeah. Just basically connecting with the human experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there was all these, there were all all these great character moments woven in that you'd never, never had seen in games and still fairly unique to Metal Gear. Um, you know, like coming in on, you know, like Snake hitting on, on uh, Mei Ling the first time you see her. And I didn't want to be creepy, but that's kind of a fun 
you know, it's like, oh, Snake's kind of a ladies' man, and you know, he, she's so cute and whatever. And that's so much more. That's so much richer to play than just uh, Snake. I'm here to give you a briefing. All right, lay it on me. You, you know, like the standard military yeah. nonsense. Like everything, everything had such a personal ring to it, and these weird emotional quirks. So it really uh, yeah. helped bond us, uh, you know, immediately um, as a cast. Yeah. Well, wasn't Metal Gear like one of the first Sony PlayStation games? Like, it was really early on, right? It was very mm-hmm. early on, but I don't know very that it was early. the first. Well, it not wasn't, the very it wasn't first. The first but... PlayStation One, but it was it was early on in the PlayStation yeah. One um, development, and they had done, yeah, you know, they had done Resident Evil and and okay. uh, I think Abe's Odd World, which actually had re- pretty good acting, but Resident Evil, you know the actors were like game developers and they were just terrible. <laughs> just the worst. I did a resident evil game and, or a couple of them actually. And when they first uh, came to me, they said, we just want to want you to guarantee that you can get better acting uh, for us. And I right. said, well, let me hear what you have done. And they sent it to me and I went, I guarantee it. <laughs> I, I can guarantee, guarantee. My favorite line reading in all of video games is, um, I can't remember the character's name, the young woman in Resident Evil 1, when she says, Monsters! Oh, you cut out. Oh, no. Again, Look at all those monsters! <laughs> you can Google it. It's hilarious. Hysterical. Hey, Chris, I, I think, um... did, we do, did we do like Dead Island or together? I seem to recall the that. title doesn't sound familiar to me, but we've done more oh, than okay. Metal Gear together. I know that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I must say to Just, cl- a little claim to fame here, I've been in a couple of the Resident Evil games and a ooh. couple of the Metal Gear games just as minor characters. But my favorite part about the Resident Evil ones is I it they can hurt me screaming because I don't care. And so uh-huh. I just blow out my lungs and everybody would be really happy. So... I get called out on online sometimes saying, were you the Gina character in Metal Gear? I mean, um, in um, Resident Evil. <laughs> so I think it's pretty funny. Really cool. Yeah. So um, wait, what characters were you on in Metal Gear? I didn't know that. Oh, I was the uh, countdown voice. Uh, okay, cool. I was a, was, there was a, a couple of ladies at one point, a couple of hookers, I think, at one point. Very, very ah! short roles. Very, very short. Yeah. Yeah, just minor things. Oh, that's so Let's cool. Look back for those now. Um, Pardon? In my, I, I have uh, another final question for you. Um, okay. Looking back, you know, 25 years later, uh, what made this game uh, different than other projects that you've worked on over the course of your career? <clears throat> oh, well, besides being the first, which is always a special thing. Uh, let's see. I don't know. I mean, I really love the character and then also being able to record with everyone at one time because that's really unusual with video games. Um, and of course, Chris and and David. And <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I really enjoyed how complex the characters and unique they were and how complex the story was. Um, and just yeah, I mean, it wasn't just like your standard shoot 'em up, you know. It was, it felt really um, unique and real to me, anyway. Sure. Yeah. I also Absolutely. think we just became a family. Yeah. We were bonded yeah, by the weird house. Yeah. <laughs> Valentino bonded us. <laughs> yeah. The ghost of Valentino. Well, also just, you know, creating something kind of special. I don't know. It just felt like we were doing something, I don't know, real for the first time, groundbreaking, you know, because it was a new platform and I don't know. Yeah. Absolutely. And I I think your performance uh, really supported that in a huge way, too. So thank you. Oh, thank you. No doubt. Yeah. Uh, Mai, thank you so much for joining us today. We, We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It was so good to see you. See your pixels anyway. <laughs> uh, nice to see almost see you, Kim Mai. Nice, nice to connect with you, Kim Mai. Oh, yes. Right. All right. Bye. I love you guys. Bye. Love you too. Bye bye. Goodbye, Maitland. <laughs>
Right, that's Kim, my guest, uh, mailing herself. Uh, uh, again, it's just so great to see that the bond that you all, you know, created uh, on this and kind of became a family, as you both said. Um, yeah, well, and like like I say, we were we were already kind of family from Guyver Dark Hero, so it was it was it was really cool, you know, Kim, I in particular coming. I don't coming think I into the door. Before. Yeah, she, you know, we just. We had this amazing cave set, and she'd be one of the people painting it. And it was all friends that had come from St. Louis to make the movie, and so they all knew each other. But then I was the lead in the movie, and I got part of this group, and it was just amazing. That's so so nice. Wow. Yeah, great story. Um, David, it's come up a couple of times that you know you were a gamer yourself prior to MGS One. Um, <laughs> were you ever the prior, the person prior to 1980? <laughs> wow. Um. Were you, were you ever the person in the room on this game, you know, MGS1, uh, to sort of give context to how the, the dialogue would fit into scenes or things like that? Like, I imagine that would have been valuable information if anyone wasn't a gamer that was coming into this. I, I think I was the only one who really, you know, maybe Chris as well, who really grasped the potential of the game. And, and once I saw the cutscenes, the artwork, the script, I was like, this has never been done before. And, you know, it felt so good working with the actors. I, I, you know, you get that sense of we're working on something pretty special. So um, I had anticipated greatness for the game. I had never anticipated I'd be talking about it 25 years later or every day of my life since then. But, um, but uh, I don't think that informed the performance is so much as just good acting, good direction, great castmates. Um, you know, like I say, it's, it's like doing a radio play. And if you were doing War of the Worlds with Orson Welles, you'd probably feel a similar sort of like, wow, we're, this feels like we're cooking. Um, so really it was just, I don't think there was any effort to make it sound like a video game per se. It was just to make it sound like an amazing cinematic uh, movie and that that was the difference i think um uh between you know what we did and what had come before absolutely yep um chris you, you spoke to uh you know how many times you met kojima something like 10 times total you less remember than the first yeah. time and three for me ah <laughs> um oh. The remember very the first, first time? time the very first time i didn't know who he was he he was a uh, after the auditions, I held the auditions. They came, and we sat uh, in the studio. And they, uh, there was like three or four Japanese suits there. And I wasn't, you know, they didn't speak any English. Uh, they'd nod uh, if they liked something, and the translator would let me know. And um, I just didn't realize who he was. Uh, and then the next time I met him was at. Um, the second game he came to the the beginning of the second game and he had a little entourage and he's wearing he looked like a rock star wearing a really cool black long coat dressed all in black and i was standing in the lobby waiting because our next actor hadn't come yet and i was playing with yo-yo and he walked over and he nodded at me and stuck his hand out and asked for the yo-yo so i gave it to him and he did a trick and so I nodded back at him, asked for the yo-yo back, and I did a super trick. <laughs> and then he just nodded and walked away. And that was uh, the next time I met him. When he did come, he also didn't stay very long because he doesn't speak English. So um, uh, He does speak English. He, just, he always has two translators with him so that he doesn't have to speak English. Yeah. I think. I think that I, I don't know at the very beginning if he knew as much English as he did towards the end. Maybe so. But uh, yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun. Oh, um, Chris, uh, you know, coming from the world of Hanna Barbera animation, like you talked about, was it like challenging for you to pivot to games? Like, was there any any sort of like uh, process for you to sort of like pivot in what in your approach at all? I not as far as understanding a script and what needs to happen and things like that. Um, but the talent pool changed a lot. Um, 
some of the animate animation actors um well it depends on the, the product too because there's cartoony games you know ratchet and clank is an incredibly cartoony game and um so yeah it just it's the same thing it's just the process is a lot longer for games because there are so many pages so you need a little more stamina um but yeah again it's just it's just acting, you know, comes down to acting. I think you'd mentioned this before, but how many days or weeks did you all have for MGS1 to record everything? About two. Mm, well, it was, weeks? I think it was 10 days. 10 days, yeah, yeah, 10 days, I think the you're first right. first game, which is an, a, incredible for the amount that we did. Yeah. I, I, I'm so... Like, I have so many questions about how you pulled that off. That, that seems like a remarkable feat with the amount of pages and everything that you had to get through. It is such a different medium than on camera um, because there's a lot of wait time between things and on camera. And with voiceover, particularly for games, it's you have to keep pushing the train forward. Uh, Jennifer Hale, love, love, love her one time, uh, did a... A session with me and we did 400 lines in four hours and that's rarely heard of so um yeah usually average is about 200 to 250. Hour. Uh, yeah yeah and the budgets are you know they make a lot of money on games but the budgets for voice recording because of the amount of length to it um are smaller so we have to chop chop you know there's not a lot of time to do anything but keep the train moving oh, do you remember on, on the first game like were there a lot of takes of things that as people sort of found their characters or um like how did the process go in terms of like trying to get through those 10 days and that amount of lines as people were new to the project well when you're new to the project it, the first day you take more time and we did have some video reference um and i'm getting to know the characters too in the first days and and the work especially game the first game some of these people i'd never worked with before so we're getting to know each other at the same time as well so it it ramps up as the project gets gets going very interesting um david was the speed different for you at the time i mean coming from animation and um on screen stuff was, was the speed of how how quickly you had to find snake's voice and do all these lines was that a challenge for you yeah, well, especially the lines are complex and weird, and you know, like they're just coming up rapid fire, and and you got to—I mean, you guys know what the dialogue in Metal Gear is like, so you got to kind of wrap your head around it immediately. And and really, you know, the really nerve-wracking thing is there's may if you do three takes, that's extreme. It's usually one, two, great, okay, and then moving on assuming you've got it if if you don't got it we we keep going but um but that wasn't really an option so um so yeah it was probably the most intense uh pace that i'd worked at because on camera is just a misery of sitting in a trailer for 10 hours and you're in mega you're doing nothing and then they call you up and then you do a scene and then they have to reset the lights and you're waiting around for another 45 minutes this was not that you know and uh and even animation you know we would do we would do more more takes. I mean, depending on the director, uh, there was one guy who would have us do it 15, 16 times. And, um, and, Funny, uh, that flashed right across my mind too. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I remember Hank Azaria getting so mad that he was asked to do more takes. Um, but uh, yeah, so this was really fast, really complex, and uh, and very strange. Um, but at the same time, it was sort of fun. You know, we, we, we got into the rhythm of it and we would just dive in and, and we just trusted Chris to know when the line was working. Uh, you know, because an actor will sit and go, ah, geez, you know, I could have done this. Or I could have done that and second guess and try different things. And, you know, we'll do 10 takes if you let us. But, um, but there just wasn't that option. So, uh, uh, but it was, you know, it was a trial by fire, but it, it was very, really exciting and fun. Amazing. I also just remembered, remember? 
Sorry, uh, just a brief anecdote. I was so broke when I got this part that when in the rare moments where I wasn't working, Chris would keep me around so that I'd continue to be paid, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the time when I wasn't working because she took pity on me because I was so poor. So that was pretty awesome. Wow. Um, David, do you remember when, when the game was ultimately released, this first Metal Gear Solid, um, and you had a chance to play it and listen to your voice in the context of everything else, what was that experience like for you? Oh, wow. oh my god, it was a freaking dream. I, you know, uh, like I said, I've been playing video games since Pong and love video games. The video game I played. What's that? I've been playing since Pong too. <laughs> yeah, well, it was the first, it was the first one, and, and uh, if you're lucky enough to have been alive in, in the 80s. There you go. So, um, and if you weren't, boy, you missed out. Uh, so to hear myself, and I had wanted to come to uh, to Hollywood to be uh, an action star, um, and I got to do that a little bit in Guyver, but my career wasn't going the way I had hoped. I mean, I had hoped to be a big millionaire action star by then, and I was not. And then getting this part was like my dream role it was just everything i felt i was meant to do uh and i got to be this incredible action hero in this incredibly cinematic game and so while it wasn't what i had expected for my career it was pretty damn cool to boot up the game and then hear myself and then see these visuals and hear all these actors around me um it was a dream and and uh and so yeah i played every single game that i was in and and you know geeked out harder than anybody <laughs> oh, that's really incredible. Do each of you have a favorite memory, something that sticks out to you after 25 years from the first game that, like, is your just favorite moment from recording? Uh, you cut out at the top of that. Sorry, do, do you, each of you have a, a favorite memory from recording the first game, like something that sticks out to you 25 years later as the, the best moment for you? From the first one. I think just it, even at the weirdness of recording in that house, um, I think brought us closer together faster. And the bond between the actors became very strong for me. And that was very special. I remember um, the first time I had to say uh, Metal Gear. And um, so I said Metal Gear. And then there was, you know, conversation among the, the Japanese producers and, and concern. I grew up in Japan, so I can tell when they're, when they're sucking air in past their teeth, you know, that something's gone wrong. And Chris says that they want you to pronounce Metal Gear differently. And I was like, how else do you pronounce Metal Gear? And I don't know, I don't know how this happened or how they communicated it to Chris, mm -hmm. but she says, well, how would you, how would you say Richard Gere? And I said, Richard Gere. And she's like, and then they all, they all started nodding and they're like, yeah, like that. And I was like, okay, so you want me to say it, Metal Gear. And, uh, First and last name. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and that's how we found it. And so every time I say Metal Gear, I'm always thinking of Richard Gere. <laughs> uh, which was pretty awesome. It was difficult. Um, many, many, many of the actors that had to say it uh, didn't have that even tone with it. It'd be like, yeah. Metal Gear. It's like it's yeah. Metal Gear. So yeah, i have forgotten about Richard Gear. Um, Richard Gear. You were like, how would you, how would you pronounce, how would you pronounce Richard Gear? <laughs> like Richard Gear. And it was <laughs> part of my shock at what you were saying that kind perfect. of gave it that ring, you know? It was perfect. Yeah, that was pretty fun. Where did that idea come from? Like, what, why, why that pronunciation as opposed to how most people would pronounce it? The Japanese wanted it equal value. Like, like somebody's first and last name. And where Richard Gere came from in the moment that was there just uh, magically appeared to me. Wow. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, David, did, as you were like listening to you know the the Japanese voice of Snake, did that have any effect on your 
performance in any way? No, but I don't think I heard. Uh, it's Akio Otsuka is the actor. I don't think I ever heard him um, until the game came. I don't think I ever heard him until I saw like YouTube videos of the Japanese version of the game. So, um, so no, it it did not affect me. I mean, really, what affected me was the script, as I said. You know, figuring out who this guy was, what he what he had been through. Um, but then also, uh, I didn't want to sound like, um, Snake Plissken from Escape from New York, which is one of my favorite movies. And he sort of whispered, like, call me Snake, you know, like that sort of, sort of thing. And so I, I didn't want to sound like him because I knew we were kind of ripping off that character a little bit. Um, so that was more of an influence on me than anything. Fascinating. Yeah, it, it's just, it's so incredible to hear how this all came to life on a game ahead of its time. Like, it's just so, um, it was so forward thinking and, and the way you all approached performance and character and everything in this game was just so far ahead of the curve in 1998. And it's, it's spectacular to hear all these stories from you. Nice. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Uh, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but, uh, you know, MGS1 obviously is what this event is all about, but the game was a runaway success and, um, you know, expectations for a sequel must have been sky high. Um, this, after, you know, catching lightning in a bottle with the cast of MGS1, with David, with everyone we've seen so far, what did your casting process look like uh, for the new characters Metal Gear Solid 2? It would have been the same. Uh, basically, I had short scripts and brief character descriptions and um, some artwork. And I was trying to get uh, voices that could match that with the equal level of acting that I'd already established with the first characters. So um, I can show you if you'd like how an, how an audition would work. Sure. Sure. So, um, any anybody out there from Metal? Vanessa, hi. Where's the camera? Oh um, dear. It's at the bottom. Here it is. Okay. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. My name is Vanessa Marshall. Uh, I, I read English out loud. It's my first language. May I? May I give it a shot? Um. Yeah. You're gonna be auditioning for Olga. Um, yes. She's an American soldier. And, American. Yeah, you guys are on a ship. Uh, you're waving away a helicopter. Snake is stalking you um, and jumps out from behind a crate uh, with his gun pulled on you. You have okay. a knife. You have weapons. And you're incredibly badass. So, uh, um, I, And I'll, I'll read it with you. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, would you do, the, do us the honors, Mr. Snake? Of course. All right, Give take one. A second here. All right. Here we uh, go. And, and then, uh, Chris, of course, you direct us if we yes. screw it up. Yes. I'm going to let you do All a right. run through and then give me some thoughts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Freeze. Hands over your head now. Toss your gun overboard slowly. A woman. Show your face. You men, you're all the same. Who are you? We are nomads, wanderers. I said don't move. Americans. So you shoot women, too? I'm a nomad, too. And you see her knife? What else do you have there? Take the knife and toss it. Not there. Toss it overboard. Hold that position. Now. Turn around. You know what you're doing. <clears throat> it stopped raining. Not too shabby, is it? New York, I mean. And that brings our tour to its conclusion. Out knife with a surprise. You a Spetsnaz? I think you deserve a little credit. No one's ever dodged that shot of mine. But no one gets lucky twice. Either. Very nice. Um, 
just for fun. Well, uh, let me give you a few notes first. Uh, surprise her a little bit more when you say freeze, David. Surprise her, okay. Yeah, she doesn't know you're there and and is going about her own business. And so you can just be a little more surprising. Yep. Uh, Vanessa on five, when you say mm -hmm. um, you're all the same, can I get a little more distaste? Sure. And American still, yes? Uh, hang on with that for a second. Sure. Um, she is not listening to anything you say, saying, David. So when you do line eight, just be a little stronger at the end there. Yeah, gotcha. And physically, I'd like to have um, Snake on 11 and 12 particularly be a little bit more with the gun. A little bit more. Is, uh, so I wasn't holding the gun it. trained on her. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. It, like physicalize it if you want to. Yeah. Uh, I can't read my own writing. Uh, 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 uh. Be Vanessa 13 slightly impressed with him. Huh. Uh -huh. A lot of action takes place before Olga's 15. So, yeah. what if, uh, will you yeah. read the action for us, Chris? Yeah. Uh, Olga twirls around, the bullet flies out from her knife. Snake gets startled and manages barely to dodge it. Olga takes uh, cover behind a crate. Snake steps back into position with his gun trained on the rack right where Olga is hiding. And then the dialogue continues. Mm -hmm. And Vanessa, 17. Mm hmm. The top of that was nice. The bottom half make it a little more of a threat because you're going to mm -hmm. attack right after. No problem. Um, and I'm thinking, do you do any accents? Sure. Wanna, you have a Russian in there? Sure. Let's do it. Why not? You got it. <clears throat> and take, take two. Freeze. Hands over your head. Now, toss your gun overboard, slowly. A woman. Show your face. You men, you're all the same. Who are you? We're nomads, wanderers. I said, don't move! Americans? So you shoot women, too? Pick up on line nine, mm -hmm. unarmed women. In the video, it's actually, there's no unarmed, so I cut no, it. Not, we've never done this to a video, so we'll stick with the script, please. Not a problem. I thought <laughs> we cut it in the original for a reason. Americans, so you shoot unarmed women, too. I'm a nomad, too. What else do you have there? Take the knife. Toss it. Not there. Toss it overboard. Hold that position. Now, turn around. David, I want to line 12. Yep. Um, give, give a little more tiny beats for the action that's going to take place between those instances. Uh, okay. Not there. Toss it overboard. Hold that position. Now, turn around. You know what you're doing. It stopped raining. Not too shabby, is it? New York, I mean. And that brings our little tour to its conclusion. And that brings our tour to its conclusion. Scout night with a surprise. You a spetsnaz? I think you deserve a little credit. No one's ever dodged that shot of mine. But no one gets lucky twice, either. Yay! Hey, thank you! <laughs> that was fun. Good I guess you didn't get my email moment. about the unarmed thing. Uh, that's, the, that's the note you sent me. Yeah! That must have been the note you sent me. No, I, it oh. showed up and I, by the time I glanced at it, it disappeared. Oh, all good. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's already that in the box. That was fun. Things. That was fun. That was one of the coolest things ever. Thank you all so much for that. Oh, you're welcome. That's pretty much how it happens. Um, 
That's how it happens. Oh, it is really fast. Like you said, Chris, it, that's incredible how you all put that together so quickly. Um, yeah, so when and you and as, as you see, she's, as you see, she's so good at figuring out how to make the, make you feel the action through the writing and through the dialogue, you know, uh, because that's a, that's a big key to the, to the voice acting. You know, you're just sitting in a chair, but you've got to make it sound like you're in a gunfight or, you know, manipulating somebody at gunpoint. Um, or running or, yeah. Or running or climbing up a thing or, or what have you. So, yeah, no, it's, it's really fun. That was great, Vanessa. Yeah. It's fun. That was, it was a great idea. Very nostalgic. Yeah. It was a great idea. Yeah. I, I definitely, uh, the scene with Dr. Strangelove, I think it's in Peace Walker when she's in the tank. That was one of my favorite scenes ever. I've, I've never, I mean, it's really exemplary of what you do. You, you would have one word, one noun, one verb, one adjective, just some nuanced phrase and say, and now do it again. It was so fun to take direction and go there and like open our hearts. I I felt like we were so intimate, everyone there that day. It was so moving. I mean, it I like really moves me. Trusting me because I remember that being a pretty difficult scene. Yeah, but it was... I don't I don't know any other directors who who take the time uh not always cuz maybe there isn't enough time but you uh, it, she really I mean right David she just gets right in there with a precise phrase that just cracks our, our instincts wide open and, and no one else does that it's just magic so thank, thank you for it's just an honor that. truly thank you yeah I have to give kudos well, to Gordon Hunt Oh, who was the director gosh. that I that I worked with for years? And back in the day, um, the voice director had a, a, an assistant director, basically, and I was I would keep notes and and things. Um, and I got to watch for many many years and observe and and watch what worked and what didn't work. And it just it it I give him all the credit. Mm. Um, David and Vanessa, had you read that scene together since originally recording it 22 years ago or whatever? I don't even that think we were together. Yeah, well, I don't know either. Yeah. Mm -mm. I remember um, being with several actors for for different scenes. I can't remember. We were, were, were we at Salami? I don't know. This game yeah. was at, um, well, I don't know. Strange Love was at uh, the one oh, on, that, yeah. on, Formosa, on Santa Monica Boulevard. Formosa, right. but you yeah, know, I, think, exactly. I think Metal Gear 2 awesome. was Salami. Metal 2 was at Salami for sure. Formosa yeah. was the company that put it up, and I don't remember the actual name of the studio on Santa Monica Boulevard that we uh, worked at, but that studio has an interesting story. It's where Michael, Michael Jackson worked often. Oh. And um, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, I kind of am wearing his jacket, so to speak. You are. It looks fantastic. A little bit. It's, it's very studios, two studios right around there where um, where I work several times, and uh, one of them had a beautiful. Uh, it was Motown stage, had beautiful stage, and if you looked up, there was a little window cut, a glass window up there, and that's where bubbles would be. Can bring bubbles to the the. They built a room for bubbles. <laughs> it just it's makes sweet. sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, looking back on on you know Vanessa, it's so great to have you here with us. Thank you um, for joining us. When you look back on uh, the materials, you know you first saw materials for MGS two and Olga's character. Like, what were your first impressions of this whole Metal Gear experience? Um, well, I had attended NYU graduate school for acting, and we had spent what felt like decades. It was only three years, but it, it the days started at 10 and went usually till 11 p.m. working on dialects. So when I saw a Russian accent, I was so excited. I was like, I'm finally going to use something I've studied. Oh, yeah. And I remember coming in and it was so thick that you, it was so authentic that no one knew what I was saying. And they were like, okay, uh, that's really wonderful. Can you calm down a little bit? 
So I, I was like, oh, oh, sure, sure. And I just sort of, I opened her, I, I opened the pronunciation. I think we, if I remember correctly, I think we took unarmed out because with a thick accent, unarmed, it, it, yeah, it was yeah. too much and blah, you know. And so I think you shoot women too was easier than you unarmed the women. Yeah. yeah that they're makes just sense. these little. Well, and because for the sake of speed and the game, the the player needs to understand what the hell's going on. Uh, that that uh, it's not like we took away any authenticity, but um, we tried to give the feel of that without distracting. Like, what did she say? Uh, and um, and so anyway, that was part of the journey. But also, I remember coming into the studio and we had to do ADR or. You know, we had a certain amount of time to put these lines in, you know, this sentence in Japanese may take seven seconds, uh, but in English it takes four. So we had to find ways to match the lip cadence or if they looked away, we could speed it up before they <laughs> finished. Or um, So it was a different kind of experience, almost like looping. Uh, so while maintaining the integrity of the acting, you know, honoring the timing, but also staying true to uh the intentions etc mm -hmm. oh there's david um but uh yeah so uh, it was it was tons of fun and i had no idea i remember i got my ps3 and i put it in and i saw the cut scenes and this and that i tried to play it was terrible i did not know olga had armpit hair <laughs> for some reason i had no clue about the armpit hair i was like whoa okay it's a genre let's go um, and, uh, so that, that was crazy, but to I, I've never seen my name. I couldn't believe they put my name in the opening credits, like Vanessa Marshall scrolled across and I almost started crying. I was like, I, I feel my life is complete. I, I actually exist or something. I don't know. I, I had never as a voiceover artist that, that rarely occurs, um, where you're you're given that sort i mean i understand at the end of cartoons there's there's credits and so on and so forth but in a video game i don't know i found it very moving uh i felt appreciated and a part of the process in a way that i had not felt so included in the because i'm in a, i think i'm in 122 video game titles and i think that's the only one that has an opening sequence that's so compelling and and acknowledges the english-speaking actors so um it, I've never seen anything like it. It was beautiful. And uh, I thought Konami just killed it. And the acting was superb direction, all of it. Uh, anyway, huge fan. <laughs> oh, and this is one of your earlier game titles, right? That you'd worked on at the time? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, did, did that, like, did it change the course of your career or have an impact on, like, your, your choices after uh, working on this game? Mm, no. I um I heard someone else say earlier uh, that they had taken Chris's uh, um, animation class. I had taken Chris's class uh, also with Charlie uh, Schlatter and um, Charlie what? Charlie Adler or Adler? Sorry, cheese. Oh my god! <laughs> I need more coffee. Oh, sorry, animals. <laughs> Char Charlie Adler. Yes, not Schlatter at all. Uh, although um, I do miss him as well. But yes, Charlie Adler. Too. At Charlie Adler is an absolute genius. And uh, so uh, from that, I I got Cow and Chicken, which was with Charlie. And um, yeah, uh, this this sort of came about. And then I I began to, you know, obviously there were other games that followed and um, we had the Peace Walker stuff and all this. It just was it was like coming home every time there was a, another version or another character. And uh, I was just deeply grateful. So it changed the course in the sense that. It, it started this whole trajectory uh, that was really magical. So anyway, I got to call Charlie. I haven't talked to him in so long. <laughs> uh, I was anyway. fortunate enough to be able to direct that uh, cartoon as well. Um, Charlie played cow, chicken, and the devil. And we did it as if there were three actors in the room. He did it top to bottom, the script. He didn't have to stop a second between characters. If they were having a conversation, it would be a real conversation. And it was brilliant to watch. He's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't know that it changed anything other than um, a, a very lucky detour into this whole world that was a, a delight to be a part of. 
Um, Vanessa, you've, you've been such a prolific voice actor and worked on so many iconic franchises over the course of your career. Like, what makes Metal Gear Solid different to you in terms of like how, working on it and and uh, seeing what it does for the fans as well? It's very unique. Um, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, a huge uh, Marvel fan, but the f sense of family that I discovered with regard to the Metal Gear community, I go to a number of Comic Cons, and there, there's always a snake. There's mm -hmm. there's usually a Doctor Strange love, and we just hug each other, and we just understand each other instantly, and that's just the way. That's one of the many gifts of of being involved in this fandom and the IP. And um, I was so grateful to have anything to do with MGS Con and uh, finally meeting all these amazing people from all over the world and hugging them and, and just, you know, I think the game it can be isolating if you're playing it on your own, but uh, it can also bring people together if you're, if you're not playing it alone and you're playing with, with other people online. And I just, I've never met a group of people who are so respectful, so classy, so kind, and so hilarious at the same time. I mean, we just, we, we, we really are a good fit. And, and luckily, the voiceover talent that is involved in the game, not complicated, not, you know, there's, there are no divas that I'm aware of. No, like, everyone's cool. just... You know, everyone's just pretty mellow and, and we celebrate the story that we got the honor to tell. We had the honor to, to you know, to be a part of. And um, yeah, the, the Metal Gear community is fantastic. So uh, an added bonus. <laughs> Friends for life, definitely. Uh, Vanessa, obviously, like David and, and Chris didn't have a chance to come to MGS Con. Anything you could tell them about that experience that was surprising to you or, or anything that they, they were missing uh, out on? This game means so much to so many people. I mean, people had um, Debbie Mae West's character tattooed on their body. Like there were Merrells everywhere and um, the cosplay. I It was so moving to see so many people really embrace the fandom in, in a way that um, it, the energy in that room, it was it was explosive and um, and yet not intimidating or 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 strange or too much it was just right and um i mean we just i could have stayed there all weekend <laughs> um it, it was great all the actors enjoyed it and um it, it's just oftentimes we do jobs and they you know we move on to the next one and we don't ever get a sense of of the impact that some of these stories can have on people's lives and so to meet people and like i said i keep saying hugging them i don't i don't i just mean like connecting with them and letting them know that they matter and that we're grateful that they care so much. Um, there was just, you know, you don't have to hug anybody. Don't worry <laughs> if you don't want to, but I, but I just like, it, it. it's just, that's how moving it is. It's almost like a family reunion and we hadn't ever met before, but it felt like a family reunion. So I don't know how you, it's like lightning in a bottle. I don't know how that happened. I don't understand it, uh, but I'm just grateful to be a part of it. And I felt lucky to be there. And so glad that it turned out even better than expected. Thanks. I was really sad I wasn't able to go. Mm. But if they have another one. Me too. Yeah. Hopefully they'll have another one. For sure. Uh, we're, we're working on it. Uh, but yeah, Vanessa, it couldn't have been, it wouldn't have been possible without you and all your help. So uh, <laughs> I think on behalf of all the fans, we, we so appreciate you and all of your support for it. Well, honored, as I said, thank you. Um, so for everyone, I, you've all worked on a lot of franchises uh, with different studios over the past, you know, 25 plus years in games. What is it about a, a Hideo Kojima script that sort of helps you craft such memorable, impactful performances? Sorry, did you ask me? I was looking at the I think chat. That was for everybody, and I'm thinking of an answer. For everyone, yeah. <laughs> The storytelling is just so unique and can be intense and can be heartfelt. And there's just a lot of elements that he brings that bond these characters together as well as, as the community and the acting. Uh, 
Maybe for you, David, like just looking back on a, a Hideo Kojima script that you helps you craft such uh, impactful performances compared to other projects you've worked on. Well, there's a lot of elements that go into a Hideo Kojima script. There's the the reality. There's the um, research. The you know the philosophy, the comedy, you know, like there's just more elements to it than you find in, um, well, than in anything else. I mean, it's just, they're utterly unique scripts. And people have asked me, like, would you write a Metal Gear game? I'm like, I wouldn't have the first clue how to write a Metal Gear game, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of writing, but he is, uh, he is unique. Um, sorry, guys, I don't know if you can hear me. You guys have sort of frozen up, so... Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Can you I hear don't us? Know what's happening now? He can't hear us. We can hear you, David. Do you want him to sign out and sign back I, in? It's, it's very spotty, but it'll it'll come back. I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you fine. But if you want to jump back out and in, David, uh, that that might help. Um, I'll flip it over to to Vanessa. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you've worked on a lot of projects with a lot of different voice directors. What makes a Chris Zimmerman Salter project uh, stand out to you? And are there any clues that maybe players or audience members would know this is a, a Chris project? Mm -hmm. Well, I already described what it, what it was like. Um, and and uh, I've worked on a number of projects. Even Fish Hooks for Disney was hilarious. Oh, that's so uh, I played. Funny. The angry mouse at the end, she was this little mouse with a pink ribbon. Um, and uh, we we had a blast doing that. But um, I feel that, again, it's some sort of soul connection that occurs. And I, I think she gives the actors permission to be that intimate and vulnerable and honest. And that the listener or the viewer and feel that. And when, when one soul connects to the narrative in that way, to me, that's a Chris Zimmerman production right there. <laughs> Cause that's what I feel when I watch other things that she has directed. And I can tell that there is a level of um, intimacy and relaxation and permission to discover um, you know, some, some directors give line readings and sometimes that's fantastic. And, uh, Chris sends us in a direction with a suggestion, almost like I said, with a, with a particular word or, or an idea, um, that, that just, uh, effortlessly creates the outcome, the desired outcome. So, uh, I think when, when people feel that, that's how you know. Mm. Chris is Chris has been there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's um, it's amazing. It's it's uh, it's really, believe me, when you're working for other people and you don't have that, it's it it's not as fun. <laughs> it feels like a job. It feels it feels like fun when Wait, when it's a job. Yeah, <laughs> I've I wouldn't know. I mean, it doesn't feel like it when we're. It, I mean, I remember we did. Um, the Dr. Strangelove character. And initially she did have an American accent and maybe a quarter of the way through, we went back and made it a British one. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember you, you, I thought, your accents changed all the time. I just thought, how is that going to work? And we went back and we did it. It was awesome. Yeah. 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 yeah that, was um, a fun, that was a fun session. Mm -hmm. Incredible to hear. Uh, David, can you hear and see us all right? I can. You're coming in loud and clear. Just talking about, um, you know, a Chris Zimmerman project and, and uh, you know, to you, what, what makes a project of working with Chris stand out to you and, and how is it special compared to other projects you've worked on in your career? Um, the other ones sucked balls. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, all voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> All voiceover jobs are the best jobs in the world, uh, but a Chris Zimmerman voiceover job is uh, makes all the rest of them look like crap in comparison. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's like, I mean, you know, it's been 
Well, Jesus. Captain Planet was, what, 1993, 94? Three, so. three or four, yeah. Yeah, so that's how long we... I was we've... still on staff, so, yeah, it's early. Oh, yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah, it's just more special. It's more psychic. It's, you know, we, we just work so easily together. Um, and also, you know, one of the things that really is difficult for me as an actor, uh, it's probably not for better actors, but I, I want to try different things with different lines, and some of them will work and some of them won't work. Um, but the danger of that is you never know what the director's going to pick, and, and a lot of times they'll pick something where I'm like, well, no, I was trying something and it was horrible. Um, please don't pick that. Uh, and with Chris, you don't really have that. You know, you're, you're so, we're so dialed in, especially on these games. I mean, we, we just feel the rhythm of it. And, uh, and I always know if I do something and, and it didn't quite work, that won't be the take that, that ends up there. So, so there's an added level of, of faith and trust in the director that, um, that you don't always have. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Um, we have a quick video uh, that we'd like to play for everyone. It's from uh, another special guest. We're going to cut away to that mm. here. And um, we'll play that for the fans on YouTube. Please go to our YouTube if you're not already, and we'll uh, cue that up right now. Hi, Grasshopper fan. <laughs> Hi there. Paul Lighting here. I wish I could be there with everybody, but unfortunately, uh, things didn't work out scheduling wise. Uh, I did want to say, though, 25 years and Metal Gear Solid is still rolling right along. Well, you know, as I always like to say, age hasn't slowed you down one bit, has it? And it hasn't. Um, now remember when I said way back when, or you heard me say, or you thought it was me, it said uh, step away from the uh, the console, you've been playing the game long enough. I'm glad you didn't listen. And you know, that was the AI, not me. And he was right though, AI is everywhere. Too much information everywhere. This information is from me. Thank you. Thank you for 25 years of Metal Gear Solid. I really feel like a lucky man. That's from me, Paul Lighting. And Colonel Roy Campbell. This is Campbell, out. Colonel Campbell himself. Um, really special to hear from him and, and about all, you know, what the fans mean to him. Uh, what do you all remember about working with Paul on, on this series? You cut out a little bit again at the well, top. Well, he was, he was. David. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul was one of the ones that I felt got 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 uh, gruffer after he heard what I was doing with the voice, and I was like, "Don't out growl me." Mm -hmm. um, so I think my first reaction was annoyance, and then he was so good and so lovable. And again, the relationship with Snake and the Colonel is just lovely and weird, and and uh, and Paul's just such a great actor. So I love him to death. Good actor. I forgave him his extra gravel. For you, Chris, what um, what stands out to you about working with Paul on on these games? Paul uh, and his family were. Um, uh, my ex husband was in a uh, acting class with Paul when my son was a year old, and so I've known Paul for over thirty years now, and so he is like family to me. Uh, he is a fabulous actor and such a delightful human being. It's just a pleasure to have him in the booth and have him as a, fr a friend. A scene that is really special to me was when Meryl um, and he got married. I'm not together. She was getting married. He found out she was his daughter. And that same day, um, Paul's daughter moved away to college. And when they were doing the thing back, you know, behind the scenes and saying, you know, the father, daughter, wedding stuff I was bawling my eyes out and that yeah it just it was beautiful it was a really beautiful moment oh that's so special that that happened on the same day as you all were recording such a powerful scene. and who knew you know <laughs> we didn't know that scene was going to show up that day wow yeah 
Um, I have to say, you know, this is such an uh, iconic series. Obviously, the fans, uh, you know, have, have been keeping this legacy alive because they're such important games and so important to so many people. Um, in today's day and age, like, we, we treat a lot of media as disposable. And uh, it, a lot of it's very quickly forgotten about. But what does it mean to each of you that this game and this series has continued to resonate with fans uh, this many years later? Well, it means it means a lot. Um, no, it's fantastic. I, you know, the the thing that the thing that really bums me out about video games is if you write a great book then people will read that book for centuries. You know, make a great movie, people will be watching that movie a hundred years down the road. You make a great video game, as soon as the console is obsolete, it can disappear. Um, it's, it's a uniquely, uh, it's a problem that's, well, that has been unique to video games. Now they're cutting things off of streamers. But, um, but I always found that so frustrating. You know, it's like you have to get a retro console to play uh, you know, Peace Walker or, or what have you. And, and um, so now that they're re-releasing the games uh, in October, I just feel like, you know, there's going to be just a whole new generation of people that can enjoy them. And again, like a great book, I want to play Metal Gear again in the same way I want to read Lord of the Rings again. And, and, or in the same way that you play a great album again, you know, it's just th that experience can be repeated again and again. And, and, uh, uh, but video games present a, a pretty unique challenge to uh, to that, given the rapidity with which the consoles become obsolete. Can you restate your question? Um, yes. Uh, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, media that's kind of uh, thrown out very quickly nowadays. Like you know, things are kind of considered disposable. You know, things are falling off of streaming platforms very quickly. Things like that. Um, you just forget about a lot of uh, content that's made. But I was just asking what it means to each of you um, that this game and this series has continued to resonate with the fans so many years later. Thank you all, all of our fans. Thank you for just participating in this game with us. Um, it's very special, and it means a lot that they still like it. I agree. I, it almost feels like I, I love the game that much when it came out and, you know, we've moved on to different things. And so to return to it and I have not fallen out of love with it, it it's just, it feels so validating to know that like, I'm not the only one and I'm not crazy <laughs> or, you know what I mean? That, that it's still alive. It's like this marriage is, is solid. <laughs> solid snake buddy right you know i i feel like it's like finding out you know your partner still really wants to hang out with you and just like it's like oh i, I still we're still in this let's go come on guys you know it it's it just and there, there may be fans like that for other ip uh you know um uh I don't know, different games and stuff like that. But this one in particular, it's just such an affirmation. I was like, all right, you understand me. Like, I, I, I don't know. It, it's very affirming. Very grateful. It's amazing. Um, I think it'd be fun for each of the fans to learn about what each of you are, are, are doing now in your respective careers. If you could just each share maybe some things you're working on now or doing in your free time, just so uh, fans can learn a little bit about where you are now in your, in your life. Well, uh, I am continuing to work on video games. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you what they are because of NDAs. Uh, in my spare time, I am a board member for a off-the-track racehorse charity, uh, which is called Win Place Home. Please look them up. Uh, we, um, uh, they're very close to my home, and I actually adopted one of their horses three years ago. So I spent a lot of my time uh, at the barn, taking care of him and riding. Great. Amazing. Um, how about you, David? Uh, I'm a fancy screenwriter. That's that's my uh, that's my main job. Um, 
after, you know, I was lucky enough to get Metal Gear in 1998, and then I was even luckier to be able to write the screenplay for X-Men in 1999. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, I was I was a big screenwriter. So, you know, most of my life is, you know, writing things, pitching things, doing deals. I have um, I've sold a movie to Amazon and recently, and and uh, a TV show pilot to Universal. And uh, so I'm, I'm lucky enough to have this this you know to work at a pretty high level in the writing, production, and occasional uh, direction directing business. Um, and then, uh, and then in my other life, I, 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 you know, I don't really pursue acting so much, but, but people offer me things. And so I'm, I'm, I played the lead Jedi voice in star Wars, the old Republic, been doing that for 15 years. Um, I, uh, just shot a short film the other day. You know, people come to me with, with like cool acting things that I can do so I can, you know, still play in that arena. Um. Uh, but my life is mostly deals and rewrites and and dealing with executives. That's it's a strange uh, situation. And then I do and then I do a lot of Comic Con appearances, and then that's all about Snake. And I do a lot of hugging, and grown men burst into tears, and and um, you know that's that's a world uh, unto itself, really. Amazing. How about you, Vanessa? Well, I'm still working in cartoons, doing commercials. I'm the voice of several radio stations all around the world and um, playing Wonder Woman currently on the Harley Quinn cartoon on HBO Max. Um, so that's sort of an ongoing thing. There's some video games, hashtag NDA, can't tell you. Uh, a couple other cartoons also can't tell you. <laughs> um, but I'm actually coming through my uh, new live stream room here. Uh, meeting all these wonderful people with MGS Con, uh, we were playing uh, Metal Gear on Gear. Metal we were Gear. playing Metal Gear, Metal Gear <laughs> on, <laughs> on Metal Gear. Okay, on the PS3, which was amazing, and I can't wait to get the new version. Um, but uh, I will be live streaming. I've created my own Twitch channel at Vanessa Marshall 1138. And I plan to uh, raise money for different charities. I, I think I have my next one. Uh, Chris, thank you for reminding me. We could do a little little fundraiser for you. Um, That'd be great. Yeah. Oh, I will. I'll I'm, send what I'm putting up. what I'm putting together is called Women Crush Wednesday, and I'm going to have the various uh, female voiceover artists sit on said couch behind me, and we're going to play whether it's Mortal Kombat. Uh, or Mass Effect, or Injustice 2. I'm in all these different games, and we're going to sort of, uh, I believe the phrase is shit talk as our characters and and try to play together, uh, sort of like I was doing to, in advance of our MGS con. But uh, I was at DreamHack San Diego this year, DreamHack Dallas. We raised $41,000 for the Autism Society. And what I love about these esports is that there are people that are having fun and also paying it forward. And that was very much the idea for MGS Con in that we raised money for the Wounded Warrior Project. And that kind of uh, ben benevolence alongside um, that generosity of spirit, alongside the, the value of play, I think there's a really uh, something to be said for work-life balance. So I'm hoping to create all that from this room. And, and, um, and so come join me uh, on Twitch at Vanessa Marshall 1138. And I hope we can have fun and pay it forward. <laughs> Amazing. I, yeah, I also yeah. want to ask the rest of you all, Chris and David, anything you want to plug? Anything you like causes or um, places where you'd like people to um, follow you? David? Stop following me. Um, uh, <laughs> well, I, sadly, I'm still on Twitter. Um, that's where I have my most interactions. I'm on Instagram at the dash david dash hater uh but i don't know how to use the dms i don't understand uh i don't understand instagram at all uh, i know there's pictures um so yeah twitter's best place to find me well hopefully we'll be at a convention together we might be able to yeah. fix that situation <laughs> yeah you show me how it works that would that would that's, be that's that a doable I am yeah. going to sign up for a lesson there too, Vanessa. I am on Instagram. I don't know 
what my handle is. Excellent. I bet you it's talking well, I, dogs. I do. But no, uh, on Instagram, is, is it Chris Zimmerman or Chris Zimmerman Salter or? No, it's it's something quite other than that. Hold on. Let me see if I can find a dog. It. I'm on uh, uh, Twitter, um, Talking Dogs. With yeah. A Z, with a Z. Oh, maybe. Yes, you are. Chris Zimmerman. That's let's see. Chris Zimmerman Salter. Chris was, Zimmerman was Salter confusing. on Instagram. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'd be happy to help you all, too, but you might have a long line of people who want to help you with these. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. So um, lunch in our future. Check out, everybody, check out winplacehome.org, uh, yeah. and you can see some of the fabulous horses that are available and just learn a little bit more about the charity. Amazing. Um, oh, and I'd like to think... call out the the uh, strike support funds um, for the striking Very actors cool. and writers. Um, uh, I, think, I think it's just called Strike Support Fund. If you Google that and you have any extra money, this is to help support people that have been out of work uh, due to the strikes and are suffering and, um, and would be well appreciated. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I'm very active with uh, a group called Step Up Women's Network. It's uh, women inspiring girls to inspire girls. And uh, basically, we help different uh, young women in marginalized communities get job placements, uh, college applications, this and that, and they can intern. Since interning with a voiceover talent looks like, I don't know what, <laughs> hard to explain. They're like, you read English out loud. I don't understand what you're doing. Um, but, uh, and it's hard to inspire them, uh, per se. So I handle their social media. Um, but I love watching them. They get placed down at, at guests downtown and work with fashion designers or with different producers and stuff like that. And we've uh, got full scholarships, uh, for some of these young girls and it's a really great organization. So, um, I also, I will say that I'm planning on having a second streaming night that will be a star Wars theme. So David, we might have to, uh, get you on the Star Wars stream. So there's just so much fun. I, I really see 2024 as being tons and tons of fun. Enough enough with the, the darkness of the pandemic. It's over, buddy. I know we're having a surge, but I'm just, I'm choosing to pursue fun. So I love you. Yeah, thank you. I would love thank to you. be on the Jedi podcast. Thank you, Eric, for putting this all together for us. It's okay. really been great. A great afternoon and morning. So thank you. Just want to thank you all. I mean, uh, thank you for taking the time and for helping us celebrate, you know, 25 years of this incredible franchise that you all have helped to life. Um, it, it means a lot to the fans that you all came out and, and heard so many stories and talked about how, how these games were made. So uh, thank you all. Oh, you're so very welcome. Um, to everyone out there, uh, please stay tuned to the MGSCon website, to MGSCon Twitter and Instagram channels for news and updates. Thank you all for coming to today's special Metal Gear Salad 25th anniversary event. Uh, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Bye. So Thank much. you. Bye-bye. Snake out.